Hallelujah, Jesus. Excellent. Excellent. Jesus. Excellent. Can you hear me? Yeah, John, I'm not, I'm not hearing myself either very well. Uh, so let me, as he works on it, we'll go ahead. Amen. I think I'm hearing. A, can you hear me now? Amen. 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 We thank God uh, for our Voice of Tomorrow Today choir and for all that they continue to do as they minister to us. Uh, it is always good to see teenagers and young adults who are giving God praise, leading us uh, in the church. Thank you so much. And, and I hope to, to say something today that'll, that'll touch you. I, I, I'm going to tell you something today. I'm going to touch a nerve. <coughs> but not just with you. I'm going to touch a nerve with everybody. But I'm not touching a nerve. The scripture's touching a nerve. And so we are continuing as we are journeying into knowing Jesus. We're going through the Gospel of John. And we are still in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, I could have done probably five or six sermons from it, but I'm limited to just three in the Gospel of John. It's a lengthy uh, chapter, but it's more importantly, it is deep. It's packed. And, and I am going to touch a nerve. Some of you may not agree with what I'm saying. That's okay. That's okay. But it is what it is. Uh, so go to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 52 through 70. This is a, this is a difficult passage, and, I, and I'm going to tell you it's a difficult passage for all scholars, so nobody is 100% sure exactly, everybody is exactly on the same page with what Jesus is trying to say. But one thing, everybody agrees, this is a hard text uh, to deal with. The Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 52 through 70, and I'm going to read it from the New King James Version. You follow along whatever translation you have, whatever, if, you, uh, if it's electronic or hard copy, if it's your habit to stand or to sit or just to listen at uh, the hearing of God's word, feel free to do that at this time. And so it's the Gospel of John, chapter 6. It's a lengthy passage, uh, and it's, it's deep, uh, but I want you to hear it, 52 through 70, from the New King James Version. Hear the word of the Lord. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live, and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve? And one of you is a devil. Amen. Word of God for the people of God. Yeah. 
Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor the title of God's message for us today. Tell your neighbor, my mind is made up. up. Tell another neighbor, my mind is made up. My mind is made up. Give a moment for our brothers and sisters. If you've got room, move over. There's plenty of good room, as the song says. My mind's made up. Pray with me, family. Lord, I thank you for the blessing of this day and how you give so many powerful yet subtle reminders of what we ought to know at all times. We thank you for the grace of this morning. We thank you for the blessing of this new day, for its mercy that has met us. We thank you, Lord, for the celebration we had yesterday with the Page family, and I thank you for that subtle reminder through the gift that said that until God opens another door for you, praise him in the hallway. And so, Lord, I thank you that whether you have opened a door for us or we're in the hallway, we're going to praise you. Whether you've opened the windows of heaven and poured out a blessing, we're going to praise you. Whether we're climbing the rough side of the mountain, we're going to praise you. Because we know as long as you are in the midst of our living, Lord, we know that things will work out for our good. Lord, we thank you for this blessing of this worship opportunity. Thank you for these young people and these young adults and this choir, Lord. We thank you for every person, every man, woman, boy, or girl, because you have brought us further than we could ever bring ourselves. You've graced us with only can come down from the dew of heaven. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us now. Help us to work out this, this text in a way that is understanding, that we will clearly understand and praise you for it and live according to it. And so, Lord, I ask that you grant us eyes to see, ears to hear, heart to understand, and the will to say yes to you. This is our prayer. But always and even greater, this is our praise. We offer to you the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. We do ask it and pray and give you thanks. And all the children of God together say, Amen. Amen. And Amen. Before I get started, I'm actually going to tell you this text has been a difficult text from its very beginning. That this text has been hard. One of the reasons that many people in the ancient times uh, ridiculed the Christian church because they saw this as they were being cannibalistic. That you got a faith that says you got to eat somebody's flesh and drink his blood. And, and the Roman uh, authorities really looked down and Nero had a disdain and many others because they misread this text. And you got many faiths today who will bring this text up because they also misread this text. But the thing is, a whole lot of Christians also misread this text. But this is a text that we've got to wrestle with because one of the things that God does, everything in God's word is there for a reason. There's truth in it. We just got to wrestle with it and find the truth that the truth is trying to tell us. And so that's why I love this text, is it made me wrestle with it. I had to consult a whole lot of, of reading and commentaries and a whole lot of praying and for God to then show me what this text is really trying to say. And like I said, some of you may not get it. Some of you may not like it. But it's not for me to decide whether you like it or not. My job is to preach the truth to you, that you might know the truth. And as the Bible says, in the truth shall make or set you free, depending on your translation. My mind's made up. It reminds me of this, this story. It's a tragic story about a woman who was, she was working on the top floor of her office building, about 10 floors up, and a fire broke out on some of the levels below her, and the flames started to go up, and as they rose floor to floor, she became trapped and wasn't able to get down out of the fire escape or any of the other ways, and she began to, she broke one of the windows up there and began to yell for help, for the, uh, someone to help her as the flames started to, to come up to her, and as the flames started started to come, the fire department came and they brought one of those long extended ladders and they brought the ladder
ladder and got it within about eight feet of where she was. And the firefighter climbed the extended ladder and ran up to the lady and said, listen, I got you. If you just jump out to me, I'll catch you. I'll have you. And the lady, she looked at the firefighter and she looked at it. It was just about eight feet. She had a time she could have got some running distance. And she looked at the distance, though, and because of her fear of looking down and seeing the distance, she panicked. And instead of jumping to the firefighter, she walked back into the office building and perished. Because of a senseless panic when the firefighter was there for her, she decided instead of taking the rescuer that was right there before her, she decided to walk back into the flames that caused her demise. The firefighter recalls the story and he said that he went up there to rescue her and he begged her to trust him to take her to safety. But his pleas fell on deaf ears. When he got down, he had tears in his own eyes, knowing what was going to happen to the woman. He said, I did everything I could to save her, but she wouldn't let me. She walked back into the flames. And I, I say that story because, in a sense, there are a whole lot of people who Jesus is the firefighter who's saying that I'm doing everything I can to save you. All you've got to do is trust me, but some walk back into the flames. Not the physical flames, but the spiritual flames. When Jesus talks about the hellfire that is there, that if we aren't careful, if we don't trust the one who's doing everything he can to save us, to trust us, in a sense, we're walking back, backwards into the flames. Samuel Johnson said something that was really important for me to understand. He said, integrity without knowledge is weak and useless. And knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful. God wants us to understand not only what he is saying, but understand and have integrity in believing what God is saying because it's a dangerous thing to know half truth. You know those folks, they know half of everything. You know, they, they think they know everything, but they really know half of everything. And that's the most dangerous type of person who think they know everything and really don't know much because they act on their half knowledge, which then becomes full ignorance and you end up doing the wrong thing. Many of you probably know by now that I love animals. I, I'm, a, I'm a nature type person and I, I love the Animal Planet channel and, and I learned stuff from the Animal Planet channel and, and one of the things that I learned that they talked about these two animals in the continent in, in the nation of Australia and it's the emu and the kangaroo and they talked about those. They're actually on the, the uh, symbol, they're on the, the uh, actual shield of the Australian nation, the emu and the kangaroo and I learned that the emu which is a flightless bird and it's related to the ostrich so it cannot fly. It looks similar to the ostrich, just a little smaller, but and it's his cousin. It can't fly, but it can run up to 40 miles an hour. It's really fast. And then I also learned about uh, the kangaroo, how it can take leaps of more than 20 feet. Each leap can be more than 20 feet, and there are some kangaroos that can actually run up to 50 miles an hour. But that's not really what kind of intrigued me, what intrigued me and it reminded me of what's going on this message today that even though both of those, the emu and the kangaroo can run forward at incredibly fast speeds, the emu can go up to 30 miles an hour and some kangaroos up, excuse me, up to 40 miles an hour and some even faster than that, that here's one of the interesting things about them, that though they can go forward so fast, they really can't go backwards. They can if they try, but they rarely ever do. It's rare to catch on film an emu or a kangaroo going backwards because it's incredibly difficult for them to go backwards because of the way the emu's legs are and its hooves are, that the structure of its body and its legs and its feet, that the way that if it tries to go backwards too fast, it will lose its balance and it will fall and fail. And the kangaroo, because it has such a long, powerful tail that is its kind of anchor, that if it tries to go backwards, it's difficult for it to do. And I like that because it reminded me that that's a good type of faith character that we need to have. That when it comes to believing in Jesus, when it comes to trusting God, that we really need, if you will, him to have an emu and a kangaroo fast. Go forward as fast as you can, but rarely find yourself going backwards. You need not to go backwards. And I say that because 
I'm having a problem with what's going on in the United States right now, not just with the political world, but when I see all these folk who say they're Christian, but they be, they're taking steps backwards that really epitomizes their faith and they're supporting things that definitely don't take you forward. They seem to be going backwards. And then you see all the time folk who say that they love the Lord, but they do things that have them going backwards instead of forward. And it lets me know that we, we got to become, if you will, we got to have a faith. We got to have an emu or kangaroo type of faith. We got to have a faith that says that I, I can't go back. There is no turning back. And I think it's a good, it's a good day to let you know or for us to understand that, that we need to be the emu kangaroo type Christians. Matter of fact, I need you to tweet in Facebook and say, I'm an emu kangaroo type of Christian. And let somebody say, what the heck does that mean? So you can explain what it means. It means that my mind's made up. I'm not turning back. That's what it means. If, since they, they rarely ever go back, that that's not something that they do, that they are more comfortable going forward than they are going backward. And so I want you to tweet and say, I want you to know today I'm an emu kangaroo tonic type of Christian. And when they finally ask, or if you don't want them to ask, go ahead and say, my mind's made up. I'm not turning back. Anybody understand that today? That's what I really, that's going to be the gist of what I'm trying to get to. Because here in this text, every now and then the Bible makes us deal with a text that is what's known as a hard saying. It's a hard saying, and for two reasons it's called a hard saying. It's a hard saying because sometimes it's hard to understand what the text is trying to say. Some, there's some text that you read, if you're honest with yourself, you read it, and you go, uh, and go right on to the next verse because you're like, I don't, I don't understand. And you got some pastors and preachers who intentionally avoid text because they don't want to deal with it. But you got some churches that will tell preachers, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to deal with it. Every now and then we read these hard texts because one, they're hard to understand, or two, they're harsh and they're hard to swallow. You heard it. You understand it, but you don't like it. I hear what the text is saying, but I don't like what the text is saying. Move on, preacher. I hear what the text is saying. I don't like what it's saying. Move on, teacher. I don't want to deal with that. And that, here's the thing. A lot of these hard sayings come from the lips of Jesus himself. And so it's hard for us as Christians, you know, if you want to say, oh, I love the Lord, but I don't care anything for my neighbor. I love the Lord, but I don't want to bless those around me. I care for the Lord, but the only person outside of the Lord I care about is me, myself, and I. You're going to have a problem when it comes to what Jesus is talking about. John's gospel does a good job of, of showing us how fickle Jesus' followers are. And how they can be. Look at, you, look at your neighbor and say, I hope he ain't talking about us. And that depends on you. <laughs> but the Gospel of John, is, and why I love the fact that God has us going through this, is that it shows how the crowds often show up for Jesus. Show up to hear his teaching, to see and, and witness the miracles, but they're really not there for Jesus. And, and after a while, you start to see that this crowd is fickle. This crowd is inconsistent. This crowd is unpredictable. Matter of fact, most were just spectators looking to see the next spectacle. We ever met those folk, folk in church? Don't look at your neighbor because they might look at you. You ever meet those folk in church? You know, they more, they there more for the next spectacle. They spectators. They ain't there to really get what God has. They ain't there to really chew on and understand what's going on. They not there to dig deep. They there to say, listen, give me the fluff, give me the dessert, and let me go about my way. But sometimes, nothing wrong with that sometimes, but sometimes God said, no, we got to dig. This is going to be hurtful. This is going to be a little confusing and make you scratch your head and say, I don't know what's going on. That's what I like about this text. So here it is that Jesus, he's, after he speaks the words that he speaks, there are many who walk away from him. And they claim to be his disciples. 
So you look at the text. Look at the text. Here it is. That Jesus, he has all these people come to him. Initially, his crowd becomes huge. If you read throughout most of John, as we've read so far, in, in the beginning of John chapter 6, Jesus attracting huge crowds. Why? Because he fed so many with five loaves and two fish. He did miracles, and a huge crowd showed up. And Jesus has this huge, he fills, if you will, stadiums all the time. And now, after these words, his huge stadium comes down to just a handful of brothers. And it appears that after Jesus speaks these words that we read in 52 through 70, that he's left with just 12. And one of them, Jesus says, I chose you, but you a devil. So his ranks goes from huge to 11. What do we do with that? What's going on? Is it Jesus' fault? Is it our fault? Is it the crowd's fault? What's going on? But here's the thing that we got to understand, that because of what Jesus said the text says most, almost all of them turn back. Jesus wants to save them from sin, but they turn back. Jesus wants to give them a new life. He wants to give them eternal life, but they do what? They turn back, and the people start to turn back on Jesus, refusing to trust him because of what he said, just like the woman who perished in the flames when she wouldn't accept and decided not to accept the firefighter's arms of salvation. But God is choosing those persons who, in spite of it all, in spite of what you're going through, in spite of the hard path, in spite of the hard sayings, you come to the same conclusion that I have, that Peter has, that, Lord, whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe, that's John's theme, believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In other words... In other words, I said, let me, let me make it plain to myself so I can make it plain to you. And he, here's what Jesus was saying. That's why I came with the title. In other words, Lord, I've got my mind made up. I'm not turning back. I'm not going in reverse. I'm going forward with you all the way. I've made up my mind, Jesus, that I'm going to go forward with you. I'm not turning back when everybody else turns back. Lord, I'm going with you. I've made up my mind. And I say that to you intentionally because your generation, just like they used to, you reach an age where you start to question everything and there's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to understand in your questioning, figure out and dig and find out what it is that you do believe in. And when you believe in it, make your mind up to stick to it. Stick to it. If Jesus is going to be your savior, make your mind up and make sure he is. Understand who he is and what he is to you. And not only for them, because sometimes I think we go along for the ride and we just go whatever's being said and we haven't questioned ourselves. If we real in this thing, Jesus is really trying to say, listen, he wants to know, are you going to leave too? And Peter said, Lord, in a sense, our mind's made up. We ain't turning back. There's no one else we can go. Who, are, who has what you have? Who can do what you can do? Who came from where you came from? You're the only one that can do this, Lord. I'm not turning back. I can't go back. I, reverse is not an option for me, Lord. You ain't got to worry about me. I don't know about the other uh, uh, 11 that are here. Peter's really saying, but, but I'm not turning back. Funny thing is, he did what? He did turn back. But God redeemed him. Reminds me of that song by Milton Brunson and the Thompson Community Singer. Some of you know it. It's called My Mind's Made Up. And when I, you, I like the lyrics. I listen to the lyrics, and it says, looking over my life, I've seen the road I've taken. I don't like it, seeing some things, some things that have got to be shaken. I've checked it out. I've been in this thing too long. Got to change my attitude. It's time to sing a new song. Because I've made up my mind. I'm going in another direction. Because if I don't, I'll end up in destruction. I'll walk and I'll crawl, but this time I'm going to give my all in all. Please don't hinder me. I'm trying to make a change. I'm going all the way. I'm going in Jesus' name. And here's the hook. My mind's made up. No, no turning back. Yes, I'm happy. Why? Because I'm on the right track. And that's what I have to wake up to every day. When the world seems mad, when the news seems crazy, when folks seem to have lost their mind, Lord, I want you to know that I made up my mind. I'm not turning back. I'm happy because I know with you I'm on the right track. That's what Peter and the disciples were saying to him. Jesus describes himself as the bread of life which came down from heaven, and, and it's a metaphor. It's an image. It's a comparison. Sometimes we read this thing too literally. 
And because they read it wrong, just like we do sometimes, it brought confusion and controversy. And here's what I love about Jesus. When he sees that you're confused, he don't back off. He digs a little deeper. Look what he did. They, they, it brought confusion and controversy, and he knew, the text says, he knew they were struggling with understanding and accepting his statement. He doesn't let them off the hook. He digs deeper into the metaphor. He says, does this, does this offend you? Does this bother you? Well, what you going to do with this? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, be honest with you first. The first time you read that, you went, what? What is he talking about? For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. That does sound cannibalistic, doesn't it? Come on, be honest. Say, it does. It does. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. What's Jesus doing? Basically, he's setting a condition. See, we read this and say, is he just like many of the false religions and those who don't like Christianity? They read it and they don't read it with understanding. They just read it for what it says instead of what it means. Jesus said in a condition on being his real disciple, he's using a metaphor. It's a metaphor that he's using, and he's setting a condition. If you're really going to be my disciple, there's some conditions that you got to do, that you got to take on, eat my flesh, and drink my blood. In other words, he assured that if they didn't do these things, you have no life in me. You might have biological life. But you won't have the life that Christ came to give. You might have chronological life, but you won't have kairos, that eternal spiritual life that he gives you. To those, he says, but you won't have the life that Christ came to give to those given to him by God the Father. And listen, that's for another sermon when it comes to predestination, because Jesus is talking about that only ones who come to him are the ones that the Father sends to him. So you saying that God has already chosen who will and who won't? That's for another sermon series. But it's another hard saying that you need to deal with and swallow. In fact, Jesus restates what he's saying as a promise. Whoever eats my flesh, if you're confused, let me make it clear to you. Because I'm going to mess you up. It says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. You know some of us would have had problems with that. There are certain things, regular things. Some of you don't drink milk. How are you going to drink? <laughs> he said he drink milk. <laughs> That's an inside joke. <laughs> but <laughs> some of us have a hard time drinking the regular things. And here, you want me to drink your blood? Come on, Jesus. This is, what's wrong with you? But they misunderstood what he was saying. And when, when Jesus finished, John tells us, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand this? In other words, what you said is difficult to comprehend and to accept. Who gets this? Notice two things about that text. It's the first thing is the verse 60, the word therefore, which means the disciples' reaction is provoked by Jesus' previous words based on all that he said. And the second thing is that they actually ask a good question. It's a good point because it's a hard saying. What are you talking about, Jesus? As I come near to, let me, let me, Bring it to a close, and here's where I really want to unpack this, though. Some people think, as I used to think as well, that Jesus was talking about the Lord's Supper. They thought he was talking about, well, he's just talking about, you know, eating my flesh, which is the bread, and drinking my blood, which is the drink, that he's really just expounding on. You know, he's kind of breaking out what the Lord's Supper is going to be about. That He's talking about the Lord's Supper, but I don't think that's what he's talking about anymore. 
I don't think that because you got to think about what he said before. What did he say in the rest of John chapter 6? What did he say in John chapter 5 and John chapter 4? What did he say in John chapter 3? Jesus is trying to make a point here, and, and here's what, he, what he's really talking about. It's about the same subject that he talked about with the Samaritan woman at the well. About He said that with her that I am the living water, that if you drink from this spring, if you drink from me, which is the living water, I'll give you living water that'll turn up, that'll spring up eternally. In other words, it'll always be there. What was Jesus' point? He was making the point that he is the giver of supernatural lives and gifts and can nobody give it but him. He's not really talking about his body and his blood per se. He's really trying to get you to understand that, listen, I'm going to mess you up, but if you really allow the Holy Spirit to work through you, you'll get the point that I'm trying to tell you I'm the one that can give you supernatural life. I'm the one that can give you the supernatural life that you are looking for. He is the living redeemer sent by the living God to give eternal life to those who put their complete trust in Jesus. In other words, Jesus is calling for a deep commitment, not a casual relationship. And he knew that those, when he got real, when he got deep with them, those who were there for the casual relationship, who were there looking for the next spectacular, who were there looking for the next meal, who were there looking just to see the next thing that happens, he said, I can't have this. I don't want to fool you. I don't want to bamboozle you. I need you to know if you truly going to be my disciple, if you truly going to be a real disciple, you got to be in this thing all the way. In other words, following Jesus means total, unreserved, wholehearted life with him without which there is no spiritual life. I bought this protein bar up here for a reason. If I told you that God told if, and you knew it was true, so it wasn't just me saying it. You knew it was true that God said if you ate this entire protein bar, you would have eternal life. Now, most of you would be like, yeah, let me have that bar. But I don't necessarily like everything in a protein bar. It's got dark chocolate. I can't do chocolate. It's got peanut butter. I'm not a fan of peanut butter. So what you end up doing is saying, I like the protein bar. I'm going to keep it near me. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to even be around it. I might open it and take a little bite of it, but I ain't going to eat the whole thing. But I got the protein bar. Isn't that good enough? Isn't it good enough that I have the protein bar? Isn't it good enough that I'm around the protein bar? Isn't it good enough that I read what's in the protein bar? Isn't it good enough that I smell the protein bar? Isn't it good enough that I get happy that I got a protein bar? And Jesus said, no, no, no. If all you going to do is be around it, read it, smell it, rejoice about it, but you don't ever eat it, you don't get the benefits of it. You got to eat it to get the benefits of it. You got to eat it. Can I eat a little bit of it? No, you got to eat the whole thing. If I told you, you had to eat the entire thing. And what Jesus is saying is too many folk who want to follow me, want to be around me, want to smell it, want to see it, want to get excited about it, even take a taste of it. But you don't want to eat all of me. And Jesus is saying, you don't understand. If you're going to be my disciple, you got to take all of me. Can I say it this way? You got to eat my flesh. You got to drink my blood. You got to ingest everything that I bring. You either all in or you're not in at all. If I can say it this way, in other words, he's declaring that religion can't do it. Church attendance won't do it. Good works in and of themselves won't do it. Hezekiah Walker had a wonderful sign that said 99 and a half won't do. You've got to be all in when it comes to Jesus. The only thing that gets us into the kingdom of God is being all in with Jesus. Having made up mind to believe and trust in him. That's why I love that song that says, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. I'll say it again, through it all, through the ups and downs, through the highs and the lows, through the good days and the bad days, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I, 99 and a half won't do. I'm all in with you, Lord. Through it all, I'm all in with you, Lord. I will take you all in. In other words, Jesus saying, what I'm trying to tell you is, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, in other words, if you're all in with me, you got to take all of me and all that I say, if you're all in, then I'm all in with you. But if you only partially, you only want to hang on, this ain't going to work for you. It's going to be hard and arrested and walked away. 
And he looked at Peter and the rest of them. He said, where y'all going to go? What you going to do? And they said, Lord, we all in. Our minds made up. We not turning back. We emu kangaroo Christians when it comes to you, Jesus. We not going another way. So I'm going to say it again today. Today's a good day to be an emu kangaroo type of Christian. Don't no girl, no turning back. Make up your mind that Jesus is the, the only way for you, the eternal way for you. No turning back for you. Today is a good day to say the same thing that Peter said to the Lord. To whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. I believe and know you are the Holy One of God. Lord, you are our ultimate protein bar. You are the only way we get there. If I never unwrap you, Amen. if I never do more than let you hang around, if I never do more than praise you, but I never take all of you in, I don't get the blessing of the protein. I don't get the blessing of eternal life. I don't get the blessing of your favor and your grace and your mercy. So First Baptist, I need to know, are you all in with the Lord today or not? If you all in, come on and let him know. Stand up and give the Lord some praise. Say, Lord, I'm an emu kangaroo type of Christian. I'm all in with you. My mind's made up. No turning back today. That's what God wants to you know. I love you using illustrations because you can get this. What he said confused you, but hopefully you got this. That's really what Jesus was saying. For his day, what he said was the same as what I did with the protein bar. He was trying to let them know that you, when you, I say my flesh and my blood, I mean you got to take all of me, all that I say, all that I represent, all that I'm here for, all that I say I can do and will do. But you only get that type of eternal life, that type of blessing if you take all of me. You got to.